it's a weird feeling being a student for 20 years and then suddenly not being a student. Yeah, in case you are wondering, I successfully defended my dissertation last week. It was really scary and I was super nervous. It, it's always nice to remember that doing a live presentation is about 100 times harder than doing YouTube videos. But given my newfound freedom and the video I posted two weeks ago, here I am talking to you with my own face. And don't worry, this week, we're not just talking. I'm Will, and if you're like me, you grew up fascinated by the amazing fiction and biology-inspired inventions that spread around the internet in the aughts and 2010s. But I noticed something. For all the amazing academic and online work done in this area, these inventions have yet to impact our daily lives. That's where I come in. I have a PhD in mechanical engineering and a decade of research experience in electronics, design, materials, and artificial intelligence. Most importantly, I dream of bridging this gap. With a focus on user-friendly and inexpensive devices, I aim to democratize superpowers for the individual, enhancing our society through rescue robotics and self-defense devices from the wildest corners of our imagination. Today we're going to do some work on miniaturizing my wrist-mounted material ejection device. This is the spray bracelet, or spracelet. Right now it's kind of bulky, but I've done a lot of preliminary engineering work to try to make it smaller. Thanks to the sponsor of this video, PCBWay, I've made a custom microcontroller that has this really nice curved shape, perfect for something that would mount on your wrist. This microcontroller also has integrated motor control so that we can electronically operate the material ejection. Now, in addition to printed circuit board manufacturing, PCBWay also provides CNC machining services, which is how I got this part. This is a brand new pressure vessel for this bracelet that's meant to hold up to 100 PSI and possibly more. It's a smaller version of what I've shown before and can hold around 15 milliliters of liquid. I've already tapped all the holes for this device and here you can see the two halves assembled. So this new pressure vessel would mount a little bit like this. You may remember I requested a polishing finish on these parts and PCBWay was kind enough to stay in touch with me to make sure I got the finish I wanted. It's very nice of them. So check out the link in the description for $5 off 3D printing, CNC machining, and of course, PCB manufacturing services. A big thank you to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. So it's about time I get to work on combining these two iterations into a single device. There's a lot of steps I'm gonna have to complete here and I may not finish all of them, but I'm gonna give it my best shot. The first thing to manufacture is the seal between these two parts. This is basically an O-ring, except not shaped like an O. My first version of this pressure vessel has a pretty thick seal with a circular cross section made from 3D printed TPU with a shore hardness of 85A. This would be fixed in a groove found on both parts. Then my second version with parts from PCBWay got rid of the inner wall of this groove and I gave the seal a rectangular cross section instead. I figured the soft material would be forced into the outer wall when under pressure, making a good seal. While this eventually worked, I was blind to how difficult the pre-pressure placement of this seal between the two halves would be. So with this version, I've gone back to a more circular groove with an inner and outer wall. But I need to write a few numbers down before designing the seal itself. After consulting a number of sources, I got a good idea of how much compression is recommended for an O-ring. I'll assume these recommendations apply for this non-circular seal. There are some professionally published standards for these elastomeric O-ring seals, like the SAE ARP1231, but of course, there's a paywall. This design is closest to a face seal, so it seems like I want around 20% compression. I'm going on the low end of this range since my TPU material is slightly more stiff than your typical O-ring rubber. On each half of the pressure vessel, the groove is 0.7 millimeters deep, so the total compressed thickness of the seal will be 1.4 millimeters meaning I want to design the printable seal to be 1.7 millimeters thick. I'm gonna take a leap of faith and give this seal a circular cross section with a diameter of 1.7 millimeters.
All right, here we have the two halves assembled with the seal in the middle. I really like how the two halves come really close to each other, so there's only this minimal gap in the middle. It's a lot better than the design that I made before, where you can see the seal in between and the gap is quite big, and you can even see it kind of just bulging out. And that's also because PCBWay has a more accurate manufacturing method for their aluminum, so I get a more precise groove here than I had with this one. So I'm really excited to see um, how the rest of this comes together. Now for the valve. I've used this general design for the valve for a long time now, and it's pretty good. A single part makes up both the nozzle and valve stem with grooves for three O-rings. One of them makes the main seal to keep the valve closed. The other two make sliding contact with the outlet wall to stabilize the linear motion and prevent leaks around the side of the nozzle. This is called a reciprocating seal. For these O-rings, I have a slightly different recommendation from my O-ring sources. I'm going to go with 10% compression. The diameter of this hole seems to be around 6.05 millimeters, which is about six hundredths of a millimeter smaller than the CAD design. For my fellow Americans, that gives the outlet wall an inward radial offset of just around one thousandth of an inch, well within a five thou tolerance. Great job, PCB way. So, 10% compression. These O-rings have a circular cross section with a diameter of one millimeter, an outer diameter of six millimeters, and an inner diameter of four millimeters. It isn't recommended to stretch an O-ring by more than 5%. 10% compression on the seal means I need 0.1 millimeters interface between the O-ring and the wall. So the stretched outer diameter should be 6.25 millimeters, representing a stretch of 4.2%. Good news! We're in the recommended range. Uh-oh. Have you started writing down equations again? Yep, that's right. There's a whole process we can perform to figure out the right groove geometry for these two O-rings on the valve stem. It's not too bad, I promise, but you can skip to this timestamp if you happen to be a math hater and a fun hater. But first, what are we looking for? We want the diameter of the valley of this groove where the O-ring will rest. This is the same as the stretched inner diameter of the O-ring. We can use this equation to relate inner diameter to outer diameter and thickness in the stretched O-ring situation. So we know the stretched outer diameter and as a result, the strain of the outer diameter. We need to know the stretched thickness of the cross section. We can use something called Poisson's ratio to find the strain in the orthogonal direction. This is to answer the question, as we stretch the circumference of these O-rings, how much does the thickness of the cross section decrease? Most elastomers have a Poisson ratio close to 0.5, so I'm going to use 0.45 for these O-rings. We can relate the circumferential strain to the thickness strain as such but the circumferential strain will be approximated as the average of the inner and outer diameter strains. We can use the definition of strain to plug this equation in for inner diameter strain. And within this equation, we plug this in for the stretched inner diameter. Now we have an equation where the only unknown is the stretched thickness. If we solve for the stretched thickness, we get a value of 0.973 millimeters. Then we can plug that into our original equation to get a stretched inner diameter of 4.302 millimeters. After plugging this into our new valve stem design, it's about ready to print on my trusty old stereolithography printer. But what about the other O-ring that makes the main seal? This one is a bit bigger with an inner diameter of five millimeters and an outer diameter of seven millimeters. Since this part of the design consists of a somewhat unorthodox interface meant to unseal and reseal repeatedly, I don't have much in the way of standards to go off of. We can't have a complete wall on this groove because it has to do this repeated sealing against its front face. As a result, we have to stretch it a bit more than 5% to make sure it has a good grip on the valve stem and won't fly off as a result of the fluid moving against it. The best I can do here for now is make a couple of adjustments. Maybe in the future I'll do multi-physics simulations to optimize this design in a more trustworthy way, which would be pretty cool but that does run up a bit of a tab. With that, we're ready for printing this valve stem. All right, so we have the valve stem here printed and o-rings added. 
I made sure to put some of my favorite grease on these O-rings to make sure that even though we have a good seal, it still reduces friction in the reciprocating direction. And now we're going to see if it fits nicely into this hole on the part from PCB way. Does seem to fit pretty well. We can move it back and forth. Let's see if any of the o ring shifted. Nope, they're still in place. So this is the first time that I've actually done this design based on the recommended compression for these O-rings. And it seems to be actually quite good advice. This is the first time I feel like this reciprocating seal is really good. Like it won't let anything through, but we can still move it back and forth, no problem. And those O-rings are staying in their grooves, which is fantastic. Nice. Now, the last step I can try to conquer today is the main structure of the bracelet. Hopefully, even if all the kinks aren't worked out, I'll get some idea of how much I'm about to shrink this thing down, and maybe even how much further I can push the miniaturization. Thankfully, I already worked on a miniaturized battery pack a couple of months ago, so that's taken care of. I'm going to keep the same valve actuation mechanism since it worked so well before, but this may change in the future. This redesign took me several hours, but that's pretty good compared to the first design coming together from scratch over several days. It was definitely a huge help to have the original design to go off of. So here we have all the 3D printed parts, so I'm just going to get to work on attaching them to the pressure vessel. So here we have our semi-prototype, semi-mock-up. It's definitely not a finished design. There's still some things I have to take care of, but it gives you guys a pretty good idea of how much I'm able to shrink this thing down. So first of all, um, here's the battery. I don't have the connectors in yet, but it will sit sort of right there. Um, so that's a complete bracelet right there with electronics and battery, whereas before, this is just bracelet and electronics. So you can see how much smaller we were able to make everything. And that's pretty cool. But of course, this isn't finished yet. On the front, we've got that same valve mechanism that we have on the original design, but we have a different latching system. So you can see here, I came up with this cool magnetic latching system. Actually, my girlfriend, who's also an engineer, came up with the magnetic part of it. As much as I like how this just kind of snaps onto the wrist. It kind of takes up a lot of space of the wristband. And with this new design, I'm actually able to utilize that by placing the electronics in this part that moves. Now you can see there does have to be an interface where the wire passes through a little hole uh, close to the axis such that the motor can get power. But it works pretty well, I think. We've got power button up here. Definitely have to deal with these exposed electrical connections. And I don't have a latching system, um, so I don't know exactly what that's going to look like. But I will say one thing that's cool that we didn't have on this design is this has the ability, just kind of just, you know, happenstance because of the shape of this uh, microcontroller. When it's unlatched, you actually have the ability to just connect it to USB-C. Uh, unfortunately, that's not a charging port, even though it probably should be, but that's just for programming for now. Um, but that is actually kind of a cool idea to have the charging port or data port kind of um, only accessible when it's unlatched. That's pretty cool. Yeah, so definitely still a lot of work to do, but 
we're getting there and I think it's a really, really good start. It's definitely a lot smaller than what we had before. I know what you're thinking. Yes, I did not shave my face since the intro. Don't talk about it in the comments, please. So what's next with this thing? I mean, we've got to pressurize it, right? To make sure all the seals work. Um, but that shouldn't be too much of an issue given how the previous designs weren't a lot of trouble. The only reason I'm not doing it now is my propellant tap needs to be replaced. I noticed it was leaking slightly and I really don't want to waste propellant, so I tossed it. I gotta order a new one very soon. Then I've gotta figure out a good latching system for this new hinge. I don't know what that could be, but it's gotta be something easy to use. Then we've got the issue of the trigger. I've been working separately on force myography, as you might've seen. That will eventually fit underneath this wristband, but that project needs a lot of development and research before we can start to put it in the device. So I'll probably use something a little bit more standard like this until then. I promise general testing will come soon. I know it seems like I didn't do a lot this week, uh, but that's because I actually still had to focus on submitting my thesis for a lot of this two week period. Now, after this video is posted, I will finally have the opportunity to do a bit more planning, which will hopefully bring up the quality of videos a lot. I think the last six or seven videos have been extremely rushed due to everything going on in my life, PhD progress, gymnastics, but that's all gone now. I'm finally able to set a schedule for myself that's fully committed to the work for this channel and for developing products for Dragline Dynamics. Those of you who have stuck with me over the past few months while I was struggling, I am truly grateful for you. And if you happen to be returning after I made some videos that were less than stellar, welcome back. I want this video to show that I'm committed to making thoughtful content. I hope you come back in two weeks where I'll show you how I'll finish up this project and hopefully get it even closer to being placed on dragline.tech's product page. Stay safe, stay amazing, and should I rebrand as Dr. Amazing? I mean, I have the certificate of completion right there. It's no diploma yet, but I earned the title, right? Or is Dr. Amazing just corny as hell? I actually have no idea. Let me know in the comments below. Bye.